How's the volume level on this? Can everyone hear? Can we turn it up a little more? Let's see, I can adjust on here. Better? Better? Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you all hear up in the corners of here? Okay, great. And let us so just kind of signal to me because we're welcome to our newly renovated accessible space uh, back in the INL chamber. So I want, where did Chief Brophy go? Uh, where's Chief Brophy? Okay, so I wanted to direct all of our thanks to Chief Pat Brophy and the public facilities team and Mayor Walsh. I, I, don't, I don't know if everyone has been following, but it's been a long process uh, sitting down with the mayor from day one and we're so proud of the work that's been done. We're probably 90% of the way there. Um, so just want to point out a few of the, the features. Obviously you see that the floor is now level with all of the entrances for universal accessibility to the floor, to the, the rostrum up here, um, and to all the council seats. Uh, we have new energy efficient LED lighting. I know at least some of us will be very proud of that uh, <laughs> in the room as well. Um, there, we're working on finishing up the wheelchair-friendly seating right here in this first row. There'll be companion seating there um, to accompany that as well. Uh, you'll see some extra screens so that everybody can see the closed captioning from all across the chamber. Um, what am I missing here? Let me see. Oh, um, curtains in the back to help with some of the, the sound bouncing off everywhere and some sound treatments up above too. So hopefully you'll be able to hear better all throughout. Uh, and just more brightness and, and liveliness and openness to the space. So um, as, as the chief was informing me, there's still a little bit of stuff left to go. So after today's meeting, there's gonna be some more work, some grates for the lights, some panels to be done, um, uh, some of the, the finished work for up here, and then we'll be fully moved in in a couple weeks. But thank you again so much to you and your team. And now, Madam Clerk, could you please call the first official role in our new space? <laughs> Councillor Baker. Here. Councillor Campbell. Here. Councillor Siomo. Present. Councillor Asabi George. Present. Councillor Flaherty. Here. Councillor Jackson. Here. Councillor Lamatina. Here. Councillor Linehan. Here. Councillor McCarthy. Here. Councillor O'Malley. Present. Councillor Presley. Present. Councillor Wu. Present. And Councilor Zakem. Here. Madam President, everyone is in attendance. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. At this point, I'd like to invite Councilor Presley up. And I would ask all councilors and guests to please rise. <laughs> Councilor Presley will introduce our faith leader for the day. And after the invocation is delivered, please remain standing. And Councilor Presley will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, welcome everyone. It is uh, very appropriate as we return uh, to our home as, uh, as counselors uh, that we um, have before us uh, this afternoon someone who has made it her, her business uh, to create spiritual home for people every day. Uh, she is a dear friend, uh, a woman of conscience, of compassion and conviction. Uh, I do believe she's been on the front lines probably since utero of every racial, social, economic, green justice issue. Um, I'm introducing her to some of you, reintroducing you, her to most of you, um, as she, her good work has uh, been chronicled on GBH, The Globe, The Bay State Banner. Um, we are just uh, so very proud of her. And uh, it is our honor to have her today to offer the invocation. Um, I do want to just read a little bit uh, from her bio. Reverend Mariama White Hammond serves as the Minister for Ecological Justice at Bethel AME Church in Boston and as a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition, a partnership of environmental justice groups. From 2001 to 2014, she was the executive director of Project Hip Hop, known as Highways into the Past History, Organizing, and Power. At PHH, she used the arts to help young people to find their voice and to create artistic pieces on issues ranging from juvenile incarceration to funding for public transportation. They performed throughout Greater Boston in camps, homeless shelters, senior citizens' homes, and public transit stations, as well as for leaders like the mayor and the governor. In June 2014, she stepped down as executive director to focus on her work in the church 
In April 2016, she was ordained in the AME Church, and in May 2017, she graduated from Boston University School of Theology with a Master's of Divinity. Reverend Mariama is very committed to engaging the faith community on social justice issues, and particularly black churches on ecological justice. She speaks throughout the country and serves on a number of boards and committees, including the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund, Union Capital Boston, and the Moral Movement Massachusetts. In 2017, she was the MC for both the Boston Women's March and the Boston People's Climate Mobilization. Reverend, please join us. Good afternoon. Oh, you guys can do a little bit better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It is so good to be here. Um, in this new space to see it um, renovated and hopefully revitalized um, in a way. And I ask that you um, would bow your heads with me um, and as we call upon um, our creator in this moment. Oh God, we thank you so much for the remembrance this morning, this afternoon rather, that this land that we live in is your land. Sometimes we forget, sometimes we think it's ours, but ultimately it is your land. We are just humble stewards, passing by for the time that we are given. And God, today we ask that you would help us to use our time on this earth in the way that you would have us to. We thank you for this space. We bless this space, this newly renovated space. And we thank you that in many ways it demonstrates that which you've called us to do. God, you've called us to make our spaces accessible to everybody. And so we thank you for the fact that it is accessible to those who have mobility challenges. God, you've called us to be good stewards of the earth, and so we thank you that the LED bulbs are using less energy than those, who were, those that were here before. And God, we know that you call us to work together. And so even as we are here, we remind ourselves that in your eyes there is no distinction of persons. That each of us as citizens are called to be part of the process of figuring out how we share this land that is yours. As we go into the weekend, we also remember that far too often we have come to this land because of painful things. We remember the genocide that was committed against indigenous peoples, and we ask for your forgiveness. We remember that far too often some of us think we have more right to the land than others. And so in this city we face a crisis where many who have lived here for decades wonder if there will be space remaining for them. And we know that for many years we have made terrible choices about how we live with our earth. We have thought that we could continue to burn and pollute and overuse and allow toxins to get into our water and that there would not be consequences. So today we think of those in Texas and Florida, Barbuda, Dominica, and Puerto Rico, who right now are living with the consequences of our decisions. And we ask that you would guide us so that now that we know we would do better, that we would be better, that we would take every opportunity to address climate change like the crisis that it is. And God, we don't forget our people in Las Vegas who only days ago woke up to find that loved ones are no longer with them. We speak out against the spirit of violence that doesn't just ravage Las Vegas, but it also exists right here in our streets. Help us to become people of peace and of love. Let us never push anyone so far to the margins that they feel that their lives no longer matter. 
This is holy work that we do today. I pray for each and every counselor that you would grant them the wisdom to know how they take on this holy work to do that which you've called them to and recognize how sacred it is that the task is. God, I thank you. I thank you for the fact that you have kept us as a city for so long. And we trust that you will bring us into the next place to which we are called, that you will bring us there together, and that we will be unafraid to be courageous doing that which we have been called to do in this, your land. I ask all of this in whatever name that you call the divine, I call on the name of Jesus Christ. May we all say together, amen. amen. Thank you, Reverend Mariama, for that um, stirring word. Uh, and now we'll uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you so much, Reverend. Thank you, Councilor Presley. And now I'd like to invite up Councillor Zakum to offer a special presentation. Thank you, Madam President, or representatives of the Renegades to come on down. Um, but I will get started. I know we have a busy agenda today. Um, exciting to welcome back the uh, Boston Renegades football team, the women's professional football team from Boston. They were here with us last year. And this year, we are celebrating, although I know it's still a touchy subject, that they were in the uh, championship game not too long ago. They were conference <laughs> champions. Um, and I'm just so proud to have them here with us and representing the city of Boston. Uh, Council McCarthy and I were able to go to one of their games and uh, do the coin flip over at uh, CM, where I got the full tour of the facilities uh, from <laughs> Council McCarthy, um, but also to see these women and their teammates and coaches and opponents uh, play a really incredible game of football. Um, and you know, this has been, over the last couple of years, uh, a joy for me and I think to my team, and I hope many of you to get to know them a little better. And it all came out of uh, delayed flights at LaGuardia Airport, where Brooke and I, who's one of the team captains, found ourselves sitting there. I think you were stretching out on the floor after a game, and I said, yes, what does this person do? What are you doing <laughs> lying on the floor of the airport? And she told me she just played a football game. I said, oh, it's what kind of football? The women's professional football team from Boston. And it was a real opportunity, I thought, to help get them some recognition here in the city, well-deserved, to help broaden um, the outreach efforts because, you know, it's hard for any team to play in the shadow, I think, of the New England Patriots these days. And it's important that we celebrate their efforts and their work. These, these women and their teammates, um, you know, are self-funding. They're fundraising all the time. So if people want season tickets, you want to buy merchandise, you know, make sure to check out the website. Um, and they have been incredibly successful uh, over the years, uh, like I said, making it to the championship game last year. And they are really continuing to uh, break barriers uh, and advance equality for women and girls in sports. Uh, their role models in their efforts and in their successes to you know, boys and girls around the city of Boston and beyond. And it's really uh, an opportunity to recognize that and support them. Uh, we also are recognizing that their coach, John Johnson, is the coach of the year uh, in the Women's Football Alliance, recognizing those efforts, uh, which is very important. And I do have a resolution to present. And I, after that, I would invite a representative to come say a few words if they'd like, but let me make sure I get the right one here. <laughs> Got a few. Uh, here is the uh, official resolution, though, from the City Council. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for supporting this and obviously a Council President. Um, but this is an official resolution, be it resolved, that the Boston City Council extends its congratulations to the Boston Renegades in recognition of your 2017 National Conference Championship and for continuing to break barriers and pave the way for women and girls in football. 
and be it further resolved that the Boston City Council extends its best wishes for continued success and that this resolution will be duly signed by the President and attested to in a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the City of Boston. So, congratulations, Renegades. Uh, thank you for having us. I'll keep this quick because I don't like public speaking. Um, I'd rather just play sports. Um, th uh, being a football player is one of the most incredible things I've ever done. Uh, during the day, I'm a scientist. Um, like all of us, we have day jobs. Uh, that's why our, our group here is a little small because everybody's at work. Um, but we just, you know, we're thankful that we've had the opportunity to get our names out there. We just want people to know that women do play football, tackle football um, with pads and helmets and <laughs> the whole nine. Um, so if you want, you know, to support us in any way, we sell gear, we sell uh, season tickets, um, and we have uh, different events for children in the area. Um, so if you want to check out our website, our Facebook page, Instagram, we're very big into social media. You can follow us there and find out more information. So thanks. If our colleagues would like to come up and take a picture. Yeah. One quick note, um, Chief Brophy has asked me to pass this along. We're still, one of the pieces we're waiting for uh, to come in is a, just a protective surface on the desks right in front of everyone. So if you could just be a little careful as you're writing things down on pen, can, if you can write it sort of on the folder or another surface, we want to be very careful and preserve the taxpayer-funded furniture uh, and, and until the final surface is on there. So thank you, Chief, wherever you are. Uh, and now proceeding with the minutes from the last meeting. Are there any changes or amendments? Seeing and hearing none, the minutes stand approved, and we will proceed with communications from His Honor the Mayor. Docket number 1297. Message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend an additional amount of $6,708,000 for the Massachusetts Port Authority for the purposes stated in the amendment to the Foundation Grant and East Boston Foundation Declaration of Trust. Councilor Lamatina, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I rise to ask that we suspend and pass on uh, docket number 1297. This is uh, mitigation to the East Boston community from Massport, and we've been doing this for over 20 years. Uh, finally, the neighborhood's working with uh, Massport to address some of the issues. Um, this year, all the neighborhood presidents met um, to work out this agreement. And it's a very good agreement. It's, uh, it's money to fund the foundation for another 10 years. Um, there's money in there to open a new senior center, to operate a new senior center in East Boston. And um, this foundation, it really supports a lot of uh, nonprofits in East Boston, including Zoomex, uh, Easty Pride Day, which is a big event in the neighborhood. Uh, a lot of the schools, church for the seniors, uh, the YMCA. So it's a good thing. So I just ask that 
the members of the body will support this today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lamatina. At this time, Councillor Lamatina moves for suspension and passage of docket 1297. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1297 has been passed. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll on docket 1297? Thank you, Madam President. Docket number 1297, Councillor Baker? Yes. Councillor Baker, yes. Councillor Campbell? Yes. Councillor Campbell, yes. Councillor Siomo? Yes. <laughs> Councillor Siomo, yes. Councillor Asabi George? Yes. Councillor Asabi George, yes. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Flaherty, yes. Councillor Jackson? Yes. Councillor Jackson, yes. Councillor Lamatina? Yes. Councillor Lamatina, yes. Councillor Linehan? Council Linehan, yes. Council McCarthy, yes. Council McCarthy, yes. Council O'Malley, yes. Council O'Malley, yes. Council Presley, yes. Council Presley, yes. Council Wu, yes. Council Wu, yes. And Council Zakem, yes. Council Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 1297 received a unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Docket 1297 has been passed with a unanimous vote. Docket number 1298, message in order to reduce the FY18 appropriation for the reserve for collective bargaining by $3,256,331 to provide funding for the Boston Police Department for the FY18 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreement between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Detective Benevolent Society. Docket 1298 will be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket number 1299, message in order approving a supplemental appropriation for the Boston Police Department for FY18 in the amount of $3,256,331 to cover the FY18 costs contained within the collective bargaining agreements between the City of Boston and the Boston Police Detectives Benevolent Society. The terms of the contract are July 1st, 2016 through June 30th, 2017 and July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2020. Include year, <clears throat> included here. The agreement is also includes increases to existing Quinn bill slash education increases to hazardous duty pay beginning in July 2017. Filed in the office of the city clerk on October 2nd, 2017. Docket number 1299 will also be assigned to the Committee on Ways and Means. Docket number 1300, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $115,872 in the form of a grant for the FY 2017 Port Security Grant Program awarded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to be administered by the Police Department. The grant would fund the installation and repowering of the BPD Harbor Patrol unit vessels, the 31 safe boat, and the 28 Quebec boat. Docket 1300 will be assigned to the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. Reports of public officers and others. Madam President, would you like me to read 1301 through 1303? Yes, all three together, please. Thank you. Docket number 1301, communication was received from Council Michael F. Flaherty, appointing the members of the working group established by order on August 23, 2017. The purpose of the working group is to assist the City Council's Special Committee on the Community Preservation Act in recruiting and evaluating candidates for selection to the Community Preservation Act. Docket number 1302, notices received from the City Clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 regarding actions taken by the Mayor and papers acted upon by the City Council at its meeting of September 13, 2017. And docket number 1303, notices received from the City Clerk in accordance with Chapter 6 of the Ordinances of 1979 at its meeting of September 19, 2017. Dockets number 1301 through 1303 will be placed on file. Um, I, I wondered, I neglected this, um, if Chairman Flaherty of the Special Committee on the Community Preservation Act wished to give an update. Um, Great. 
Okay, so dockets 1301, 1302, and 1303 will be placed on file. Reports of committees. Docket number 0106, the Committee on Government Operations, to which was referred on January 11th, 2017. Docket number 0106. Message and order approving a petition for a special law regarding the Jim Brooks Stabilization Act, which is known as Just Cause Eviction. Submits a report recommending the Home Rule petition ought to pass in a new draft. Chair recognizes the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam President, and just ask for everyone's indulgence. So this has been a very lengthy uh, but very transparent process involving many parties, so asking your indulgence to read what I consider to be sort of an exhaustive report but puts everything in perspective. Uh, this matter was sponsored by Mayor Martin Walsh originally on December the 7th of 2016 that carried over to January 11th of 2017. The purpose of this Home Rule petition is to offer guidelines for both tenants and landlords who encounter situations that may lead to the eviction of a tenant. After a six hour public hearing that was held on March the 6th of 2017, followed up by a lengthy working session on May the 8th of 2017, we heard public testimony from the City of Boston, Chief Sheila Dillon of D&D, Deputy Director Lydia Edwards of the Office of Housing Stability that both supported this proposed legislation. We also heard testimony from proponents, a variety of community-based organizations, along with opponents, real estate attorneys, property owners, et cetera. The matters that were discussed at both the hearing and the working session include the need for a housing market that complements the population growth in the city, solutions to high cost of rent and displacement, the rights of landlords versus tenants and tenants versus landlords, and how an educational component may be beneficial, the current process in place for eviction and housing court proceedings, the legal implications that this legislation could have, such as making it more difficult to remove bad tenants from a property, how this will affect residential development in our city, how this proposal may or may not be a form of rent control. The administration stated on the record that it was not. Opponents of the proposed uh, proposal explain that there are existing state laws in place that currently govern landlord and tenant relationships and that certain provisions in the proposal would bypass the traditionally, traditional housing court method. Quick presented in a new draft to clarify the intent and to place notice requirements on the landlords. The following changes include revisions to the purpose clause, in order to make it clear that the purpose of the proposal is to provide stability of housing. In order to promote stability, the amended draft notice requirements are on the landlord and the foreclosing homeowner. Requiring landlords or foreclosing homeowners to provide tenant information concerning their basic housing rights and resources when serving a notice to quit or other notice of lease non-renewal or expiration. This notice shall be prepared by the Office of Housing Stability and shall be referred to as the city's rights of notice. The landlords or foreclosing owners would not be required to provide, would also be required to provide tenants or former homeowners with written notice on forms prepared by the Office of Housing Stability when exercising a right of lease non-renewal or expiration at least 30 days in advance of commencing any summary process action against the tenant or former homeowner along with the city's rights notice. The landlord or foreclosing owner shall also provide a copy or copies of the aforementioned city termination notice to the Office of Housing Stability. Under the definition section, it's the superfluous definition has been removed that do not have any legal effect on this proposal. There has also been removal and or conditions of terms of consistency. Under the applicability provision of section four, the following changes have been made. Subsection E has been amended by striking the paragraph as initially filed and replacing it with public housing units managed by the Boston Housing Authority and other residential rental units such as federal public housing that are subsidized and regulated under federal laws to the extent such applicable federal laws expressly preempt the provisions of this act. The provisions in section five in the initial document that identify conditions in order to evict have been removed because of the protections in place under state law and the procedures currently available in the housing court. The amended version would require non or former homeowner with the notice of basic housing rights and resources as well as city termination notice on the forms prepared by the City of Boston's Office of Housing Stability. A new Section 5A has been added. Section 5A establishes just cause eviction for homeowners. Section 5A would prevent a foreclosing owner from recovering possession of housing accommodation unless the court finds that certain conditions are met. And lastly, the remedy section has also been amended to include the following provisions. 
dismissal of action for failure to provide notice of rights, dismissal of action for failure to provide the tenant or former homeowner a timely city termination notice, and a provision indicating that the remedy section of the act is not exclusive. The grounds for eviction provision and the damages provision have also been removed. Rationale for having this matter passed a new draft. This matter, as we all know, has been a very long-term, ongoing conversation with many stakeholders. Uh, there are many pieces uh, of this that are governed by state law, uh, and there is no doubt that residents in Boston are being priced out and or, in some instances, kicked out. There is a consensus on the importance of data collection. We heard loud and clear from both the hearing and the working session. What is really needed is the data collection. The City of Boston has tremendous resources between the BRA and D&D &D and now coming online in the very near future, CPA. Funding will be there. Where to direct it is really the question. Uh, and uh, getting the data to find out where the displacement is taking place and more specifically who's doing it uh, will really be the crux of uh, what both Councilor Baker and Councilor Zakem uh, will be speaking on shortly with an, an ordinance that we are introducing today uh, as really the sum and substance of what we learned from both the hearing and the working session. But requiring the landlord to also notify the city when exercising a right of lease of non-renewal or, or expiration may further assist in also preventing the ability to recover possession upon failure to do so provides the city with the enforcement authority and the capabilities. The city would not have the enforcement authority or capabilities um, without this home rule petition. So requiring landlords to provide notice to the city when exercising a right of lease, non-renewal, or expiration will allow the city to target the appropriate resources and then will provide a mechanism for enforcement in the event that there's violation. Preventing displacement, providing education to tenants, and notice to the city are consistent with the objection of this proposal and will also will come to the forefront with respect to the ordinance that is being introduced today around data collection. Again, we want to stop the displacement but in order to do so and in order to direct our resources appropriately, we need to learn where it's happening and we need to know who's doing it. I would also like to acknowledge a, a number of different groups and organizations. Uh, the mayor of the city of Boston, uh, Chief Sheila Dillon and her team at D&D, &D, uh, Assistant Corporation Counsel Sammy Nabulsi, Deputy Director of Policy and Development Bob Garrett, along with their staffs and the staff of Office of, Office of Housing Stability, uh, the members of City Life, uh, Viva Urbana and the Right to the City Coalition. Our very own staff attorney, uh, City, Council Christine, uh, City Council Attorney Christine O'Donnell, she's been on point in keeping track with the entire conversation and all of the moving parts from all of the different parties, bringing logistical and these legal concerns uh, to our attention and making sure that the revisions are reflected properly and that are adherent to current state law. Uh, to my colleagues and their staff that have been part of this conversation, and also to the real estate folks. They've been an equal partner, uh, specifically the Bar Greater Boston Real Estate Board and the Small Property Owners Association, along with individual landlords uh, who took time out of their schedule to come down to City Hall to have their voices heard. Uh, and we very much, and I very want to emphasize this, we very much understand the legal, financial, and logistical concerns that you raised and would like to say that this is going to be an ongoing conversation. So as chair of this Committee on Government Operations with respect to docket zero, message in order approving a petition for the special law known as the Jim Brooks Stabilization Act, also known as Just Cause Eviction, I'm submitting a report recommending that the docket ought to pass in a new draft. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Councilor Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I thank uh, Councilor Flaherty for chairing, uh, obviously chairing the Government Operations Committee and working through this process, uh, as evidenced by the committee report, this was a long, uh, extensive process with many stakeholders. I want to thank many of the folks who are here today who participated and who as advocates uh, on both sides. It was uh, certainly an interesting process, and as a chair of the Committee on Housing and Community Development, I think uh, we've come out with a good product, and I look forward to voting in favor uh, of the bill today. I think, as Councilor Flaherty said, we had a ongoing discussion with numerous stakeholders from tenant advocates from some of the advocacy organizations he named, uh, from the real estate community, from the mayor's office, and obviously many of our colleagues. I think we've presented what is an interesting um, and an important approach forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about the ordinance that Councilor Baker and I are introducing later when that comes up on the agenda. But we found, I think, a two-pronged approach that I am hopeful uh, when enacted will make a real difference uh, in our communities and make sure that folks are not being displaced while at the same time making sure that when people, there is a just cause for eviction that folks uh, can be removed when it's deserved. But in the meantime, I just want to thank um, everyone who participated in this process. I'm excited uh, to vote on this bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. Last night, I joined uh, all the candidates running for city council at large uh, for a forum in Rosendale. Uh, the very first question posed to us uh, was about the housing crisis and what we can and would do to stem displacement. Uh, of course, this was in Rosendale, but we get asked this question in every room and every neighborhood that we are in. And I will say what I said last night. Housing is a human right, and the displacement of families needs to be addressed as the public health crisis that it is. Being evicted is destabilizing and devastating to our families and our neighborhoods and threatens the very diversity um, that we say we value and celebrate as a city. My Director of Constituent Services spends about 60% of her time addressing concerns around safe, clean, and affordable housing. And while certain neighborhoods are feeling the burden more acutely and publicly, displacement is happening in every single neighborhood. I want to thank the coalition, but before I say that, let me just say rest in power, Jim Brooks. So I want to thank the coalition that has been championing this legislation for nearly two years for your tireless efforts, your willingness to compromise and keeping your eyes on the prize every step of the way. I want to thank uh, Chairman Flaherty for uh, his patience and for such a robust process and his stewardship throughout this. And I want to uh, thank the landlords who are legitimately being stressed by rising assessment values, building costs, and inflation for doing the right thing. The Office of Housing Stability um, as well. And it is unfortunate that at times during this debate about this legislation, it has pitted a landlord against tenant and vice versa. Um, but surely uh, we can all agree and have come to a place to recognize that everyone, regardless of their position or wealth, or a homeowner deserves to know their rights. And that is why I'm supporting this legislation today. We cannot fully address a problem we do not have complete data for. We need to know who, where, and how evictions are happening in the city. And for a host of reasons, we have not been able to access the housing court data around this issue. But even putting those challenges aside, we know that this would not give us the full picture of displacement, and that's why we need the Jim Brooks Stabilization Act. So again, I want to commend the coalition uh, the House, Office of Housing Stability and Chairman Flaherty. I hope this legislation and the reports that result from it will continue to inform our policies to ensure that everyone in the city of Boston has a place to call home. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. I just, want, I just want to remind everyone, we so appreciate that you're here. It's a new space, but the rules are the same. Uh, we, we ask for silent appreciation just to make sure that everybody can hear everything that's happening. So, um, you know, emotions are on high. We're so happy you're here, but please just use fingers instead of, instead of applause. Thanks. Councilor Sabi George, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise today in support of the Jim Brooks Stabilization Act. I'd like to thank the administration, all of my colleagues, especially those that spent sort of the bulk of the, their time uh, most res recently on this work. And of course, I'd like to thank the advocates uh, for participating in this process. We've heard from so many constituents and to everyone who has called and emailed and testified at a hearing, thank you. We are in the middle of Boston's biggest boom and every day we are scrambling to help people who are being swept up in the tide of change. And the reality is we have very few tools to help. Although I am proud to support this home rule petition today, I'd like to point out that there is still work to do and we need everyone's help to do it. As chair of the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health and Recovery, my primary concern has been that th those that are most vulnerable. We know that the top evictors in the city are actually some of our largest owners of, sub of subsidized and affordable housing. We have not addressed that issue. At the same time, I believe that this process has shown a light on the challenges that many of our small property owners face. And I hope that we can continue the conversation about escrow accounts and technical support for small landlords, many of whom are doing the right thing by their tenants. I believe that this small step in the right direction will help us build stability across our neighborhoods. And I look forward to voting in favor and continuing this work. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Campbell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to thank uh, Councillor Flaherty and, and for your work on this and also the mayor for supporting this and his administration for their work on this along with D&D. Um, I want to sort of echo Councillor Presley's comments about you know, the calls that we get through constituent services. We often get um, calls 
every day, I think, talking about folks in the community who have been living in a home 10, 20, 30 years and are now being displaced or being asked to leave um, and who no longer can afford to live in the city of Boston. It's one of the devastating calls that we get to be able to not be able to find a solution for a family um, in this great city that we call home. I will say, while I'm happy with the just cause eviction ordinance and some of the compromises that are made, including the data collection, which is extremely important, I think through stories we can tell you that we already can paint the problem, um, but it's important to have data to back it up. But I do hope that we actually go a little bit farther. Um, it's important to have data collection. It's important to have notice. This is a notice requirement statute. If anything, it just requires us to send some information to our landlords. One of the things that frustrated me during the hearing that we had on this, or one of the many hearings, is asking the question, what will this do to solve the problem? And I was extremely devastated to learn that this might do very little. So I'm excited that it's going to pass today, and I hope it will, and I think it will. Um, I'm excited about that, but I'm concerned about whether or not this will actually address the nature of the problem. This is a serious problem in the city of Boston. It's a crisis. So we need solutions that arise to the level to actually allow people to stay in this city. Um, so this is one step. We have many steps we have to take. Um, I look forward to working with uh, landlords, those who are involved in the real estate market. I think they have great and many of them brought them to our office. And many of them were concerned that this statute and this ordinance also would not address the crisis and had some incredible creative ideas. So I hope that we can, instead of painting it, versus, painting it as us versus them, that we can come together to come up with even more solutions to keep people in their home before it's frankly too late. Um, I want to thank the advocates. I want to thank the advocates especially for holding us as electeds accountable. Many of us, when we campaigned, said we were going to support just cause eviction. And then you guys came and we were like, well, we don't really know. Yeah. So thank you for holding us accountable. We only get things done at this level when you guys show up. I tell folks in my district all the time, show up, vote, turn out, show up at hearings, send us emails, call our office. We want to be involved. We want to get things done. So thank you to the advocates who took time off from work today to be here. Thank you to the landlords and the various um, interest groups that showed up and also brought ideas. I hope we can adopt some of theirs as well. Um, and thank you, Council President, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Councilor Linehan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, it's, uh, it's important that I rise here today. I, I listened to all my colleagues, and um, what they said is, is very important. Many of the matters that uh, they touched on and the issues that uh, face our city are so true. I want to uh, uh, commend everybody who's worked on this, especially uh, Chairman Flaherty for, for his efforts to uh, continue to diligently work on a very difficult matter, listening to all sides, the administration, and how folks are, are trying to come together around this particular piece of legislation. But uh, I rise to say I will not support this. I, I don't think that this uh, truly addresses the matter. I never said that I was going to support just cause eviction because I felt that uh, there were ample uh, laws and, um, and, and bureaucracies in place to address these issues. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I, I stood up and made my position clear. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Linehan. Please, everyone, remember. Um, Councillor Flaherty, you have the floor. Just one last one. I, I, I mentioned her in my comments, but I just actually saw she was here. I wanted to single out the great work of Chief Sheila Dillon from D&D. &D. Um, very, uh, very passionate about the issue of housing, uh, but was uh, she deserves a round of applause, but I know I'm violating the protocol. Um, <laughs> But she's very passionate about housing and, and the issues of housing in our city. Very thoughtful, uh, very deliberative, uh, excellent to deal with in this process. I, I can speak for, for both uh, Council Baker and, and Council Zakim as well because we went back and forth. But uh, she was dealing uh, with a, a multitude of factors and dealing with a variety of different parties and issues. I'm sure she took some heat in, in different circles, but she did a phenomenal job. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least get an opportunity to single her out in her efforts, uh, not just on this issue, but on behalf of our entire city and on behalf of the issue of, of affordable housing. So. Uh, thank you, Sheila, for your, your time and attention to detail on this. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Jackson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I rise um, in support of this matter, uh, and I want to thank Councillor Flaherty um, and others on our council uh, for the work that they have done. I also want to thank, um, in particular, 
uh, the advocates who forced this. Because I do want to note that uh, this administration was slow on this matter. They dragged their feet on this matter, Madam President, um, and ran the clock on, on this matter. Um, and I believe in that time, many people were harmed. Many people were displaced. And many folks don't currently live in the city because of the foot dragging uh, that has occurred. So let's, let's talk about the city of Boston in terms of rents. Uh, Zillow says that the average price of all apartments is $2,480. Zumper has it at $3,058 for all bedrooms. Uh, Boston is the fourth highest in foreign speculation in the United States, as well as one of the fastest gentrifying cities in the United States of America, based on information um, you can get from the Cleveland Fed. We know that vacancy is at an all-time low. It's actually down 50%. And we are operating in about a 2% vacancy rate in the city of Boston. And owner occupancy in my district, in Roxbury, owner occupancy is 19%. Others in Roxbury are at the will the whim of those who own uh, in that area. In West Roxbury, uh, where uh, my friend Councilor O'Malley represents, um, it's 67 percent. Um, and the Boston Fed has noted, and, and hopefully we'll have more accurate data based on uh, what we get from the Jim Brooks Act, that there are 5,000 eviction cases annually. 5,000 eviction cases annually. And I want to put this into perspective that we are talking about a city where everyone's bragging about it being great. The greatest economic times that we've had in the city of Boston's history. Well, is it great for everybody, Madam President? Is it great for the 5,000 people on an annual basis who are being evicted? And we don't know if they've all been pushed out, but we will find out. And we will find out that many of them uh, have been uh, pushed out. 68% of Bostonians are renters. Nearly half are rent burdened. And the wages have been stagnant. And I would note 55% of renters are people of color in the city of Boston. The question is, is Boston great for everybody and not just some people? My friend uh, who's next to me, to my left, uh, Councilor La Martina, in East Boston, development pressures have driven up uh, uh, rent increases uh, to nearly 30 percent uh, increases on an annual basis. And I guess we also have to note what we're building. 87 percent of the housing that's being built in the city of Boston is for the top 20 percent and does nothing to deal with the fact that 50 percent of people in the city of Boston make $35,000 or less, and that we live in a city It is going to require courageous leadership to do something about this. It is going to require, yes, the Jim Brooks Act would shine some sunshine, on, on this, and I would note that symbolic changes mean nothing without real substantive action, and this is one baby step. And making rosy claims that rental costs are going down do nothing for the people who call our offices, who are being displaced on an annual basis and on a daily basis. Uh, it is going to require courageous leadership. It's going to require courageous leadership that steps forward and increases the IDP from 13%, Madam President, to 25% in the city of Boston. Madam President, it is going to require courageous leadership that is going to state that on any parcel of city land that leaves the city's hands, there needs to be 30% low income, 30% middle income, and 30% market rate. 30, 30, 30, or you don't get it. We must, as a body, step forward and not only make plans 
for the richest of those. We had a whole department in this building that was created for Boston 2024 Olympics, a whole department. We had tens of employees who planned for an IndyCar race in the city of Boston. And we, had, uh, we have an administration that was willing to give $25 million to one of the richest countries and uh, companies in the history of man, uh, General Electric. It is about time, it is our time in the city of Boston that we stand up and do something for the majority of the people in the city of Boston who are being pushed out of our city on an annual basis. Step. This is actually not, this is actually not what the advocates initially asked for. Let's also note that. We have an opportunity to take a baby step here today, but the question is a question of conscience and a question of backbone, and it's actually a question of leadership as to whether or not we are willing to take steps that will substantively change whether or not we have a right in our city to remain if you're poor, if you're working class, and if you're middle class in the city. I will be supporting this today, but it has to be an and, not an or, Madam President. We have to not only have faith, but we actually need uh, to have works that are attached to our faith. Thank you so much, and I look forward to supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Baker, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, I rise today to just uh, show my support. I do think that this is a, a good first step as far as um, data collection and, and, and trying to figure out patterns and trends and where these things are happening. I would say the city of Boston is great. It's not always great for me. It's not always great for you. But all you have to do is go around to some other cities, see what's going on, and see that those cities are suffering. So. To, to, to be in a city where people actually want to be and actually want to move to. I remember the days when if you owned a three-deck, a lot of times the, uh, the rent didn't even pay the mortgage. So I remember those days. I don't want to go back to those days. Um, and I also wanted to commend uh, especially Councillor Zakem, who, who was along for the entire ride here, and also Councillor, Councillor Flaherty, who, who really wrapped it all together. And, and, um, Maybe it's not everything the, the advocates want. It's certainly not everything that the um, real estate community wants. Maybe that's good legislation. Nobody's happy. So, um, <clears throat> but thank you. I, I will be supporting this today. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Anyone else before Councillor Flaherty gets the final word? No takers. Councillor Flaherty. Right. Just uh, through the chair, just a, a comment from uh, one of our colleagues. I just want to explain. So the delay and to, to say that it, uh, the mayor filed this in 2016. He wanted it passed in 2016, and then it was refiled in 2017. He wanted it passed right out of the gate. Uh, in fact, he had asked me a hundred times, what's going on with this? What's going on? We got to get this passed. So I just wanted, for the record, state that uh, with respect to the delay, that was the legislative process. That was sort of making the sausage piece of it. Um, and when we had the six-hour hearing, and it would really rose to the top was the data collection piece um, and our efforts to try to bring the data collection piece into the home rule petition, along with a multitude of moving parts. Uh, lots of uh, interested investors parties, but also the legal intricacies, which really points to the work that uh, Christine O'Donnell did on behalf of this body and also on behalf of the city, sort of maneuvering and weaving around state law, working with attorneys in a variety of different sectors. So, um, so that was really the, the, uh, the impetus behind the delay. There was no intentional slow dance. Uh, it clearly was not um, uh, at the mayor's directive. In fact, yeah, it was to the contrary. The mayor kept saying, let's get this done, let's pass this, let's pass this. And of course, as the chair of government operations, with two hands on the wheel the entire time, working with colleagues, but also working with sort of a broader based community out there, uh, it took a little bit longer than probably one would expect. But again, we're here today uh, to obviously celebrate a great opportunity to, in the memory of, of Jim Brooks, to move something forward. And as I had alluded to in the, my final comments was that this is an ongoing discussion. This is an ongoing process. We have uh, in this docket today an ordinance that also hopefully will speak to the other piece that rose to the top. But I just want to make sure that we're all in this together. There's no one sort of blaming. I think everyone recognizing that we have the housing crisis, that people are being displaced, particularly our fixed income folks and seniors in particular. We hear it every day in every corner of the city. Uh, Boston is a hot place. It's an attractive place. Everyone wants to be here. The problem is that people are being priced out. We're trying to do our part, uh, but there was lots of moving parts, and I just want to explain that was not to be blamed in any direction or finger pointed in any direction that we're all in this collectively together. We're all Bostonians. We all recognize there's a problem, and we're all prepared to roll up our sleeves and work at it. And we'd love to have it done yesterday. 
but it is what it is, and we're here today, and hopefully we can celebrate moving forward with this, uh, this vote today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. At this time, Councillor Flaherty moves for passage, acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 0106. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Nay. Oh, Madam Clerk reminds me, passage of docket 0106 in a new draft. Um, I am hearing uh, Councillor Linehan registering as a nay. Otherwise, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll on docket 0106. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Siomo, yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Asabi George, yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Flaherty, yes. Councilor Jackson, yes. Councilor Jackson, yes. Councilor Lamatina, no. Councilor Lamatina, no. Councilor Linehan, no. Councilor Linehan, no. Councilor McCarthy, no. Councilor McCarthy, no. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Councilor Presley. Yes. Councilor Presley, yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Councilor Wu, yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Councilor Zakem, yes. Madam President, we had um, on docket number 0106, we had three in the negative and 10 in the affirmative. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket 0106 has been passed with a 10 to 3 vote. <laughs> Matters recently heard. Matters recently heard for possible action. Docket number 1063, an order authorizing the City of Boston to adopt Community Choice Energy. Chair recognizes the Chair of the Committee on Environment and Sustainability, Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the action we're about to take may rank among the most important things many of us do this year. I want to begin by thanking my co-sponsor on this initiative, the City Council President Michelle Wu, uh, who's been a great partner and friend to me on this and so many other environmental initiatives. Uh, she has become a trusted partner, a dear friend. I'm very grateful for your uh, leadership and collaboration on this, particularly for her team and my team. I want to thank Jessica Mars from my team, uh, as well as central staff who has uh, really helped carry this through the, uh, and really been the glue that has helped to hold it together. I want to thank all of you, my colleagues, for your engagement throughout this process. You asked thoughtful questions and you pushed to make this order better. Uh, I'd like to thank Mayor Walsh and his team. The mayor and I have been in close contact over the last couple of days and he and his team, like many of you, have pushed us all to write a better order. Some minor changes from the law department are reflected in the new draft before all of you today. They are uh, a technical change uh, under the first, uh, therefore be it ordered. Uh, and the the second change is in the paragraph under the first, be it further ordered, later language was changed to be more compatible with future initiatives and language was added to include other governmental approval. And finally, in the paragraph under the second, be it further ordered, language was added to ensure transparency of the financial impacts to rate payers. Finally, and most importantly, I want to thank the advocates who have made this day a reality. To BCAM, the Green Justice Coalition, West Roxbury Saves Energy, 350.org, ACE, BCEC, BSAC, CPA, Community Labor United, Greeting Rosy, Mothers Out Front, Environment Massachusetts, Clean Water Action, and Sierra Club, and countless others, you have made this happen. We would not have carried the ball to the end zone but for your tireless advocacy and work. I give you a very profound and heartfelt thank you for. city or town to choose the electrical supplier for its residents and businesses. Currently, 127 cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth have adopted some form of CCE. Today, we are seeking to make Boston the 128th, and obviously the most impactful. By opening a transparent and fully vetted process, we can leverage our sheer size. There are well more, there are well more than 200,000 accounts among our 650,000 residents and businesses to negotiate a better deal for ratepayers with an increase of our renewable energy portfolio. Think of this as the Costco effect. Costco can sell items in greater bulk but at a lesser price to individual price because of the sheer quantity of product. The same economic, the economic theory holds true for Boston in this regard. Studies have shown that Boston can increase its renewable energy source for electricity by up to 6% without an increase to the ratepayer. Our order today is calling for an increase of 5%. We will also have an opt-out proviso so that any individual or business can, of course, opt out. 
uh, and we will also have an opt-up proviso so that any ratepayer may, if they so choose, opt up to 100 percent of renewable energy sources. Now, there are significant safeguards here to protect all ratepayers, not the least of which is once we authorize this, we then uh, uh, charge the Walsh administration to begin the process of procurement and sort of data collection. If they are unable to find a supplier who is at or below the default rate, we will not proceed. Additionally, if we opt in and find a supplier that conforms to our increase in renewables in price and changes that down the road, we can pause the program. This is precisely what the town of Melrose is, hap is doing right now. Assuming we do, and I feel very confident that we will be able to find several suppliers to achieve our goals, we will then begin a very robust community process on educating the public about our transition to CCE. I think we've already seen a head start. Awareness by many of the people in this room who have been with the citizens' associations, uh, watches, ward committee meetings, and other neighborhood groups to talk about this issue and garner some great grassroots support. It should be noted that Eversource will still deliver electricity, will fix outages, and send residents bills. Ratepayers will not have to deal directly with the alternative supplier. Their job, the alternative supplier's job, is to contract with the power plants, windmills, solar arrays that produce the electricity. Additionally, once this is done, we will convene a working group made up of advocates, members of this body, and other stakeholders to work with the administration going forward. Now, why are we doing this? There is no leadership, absolutely no leadership, coming from this president and his cabinet uh, on issues addressing climate change and the inherent effects that come. I would argue that in many instances they're rolling back regulations and they are making matters much worse. It is up to cities to lead on climate change. Making an additional 5% of our residents' electricity come from renewable energy is the equivalent of removing 6,400 cars and trucks from our streets. It is the single largest way of reaching our greenhouse gas reduction goals of 25% by 2020 and 80% by 2050. It also means less air pollution from power plants. It addresses environmental justice. It creates green jobs. It creates green infrastructure. Simply put, it builds a greener Boston. Once in a while, it's very rare that this happens, but once in a while, things are not too good to be true. As has been demonstrated by cities and towns throughout this Commonwealth, in over 1,300 municipalities throughout the country, community choice will meet or lower costs while increasing class one local renewable energy sources and there are protections in place if those goals are not met. Sound environmental policy is good for the planet, good for green job creation, and good for the ratepayer. It doesn't get much better than that. Now before I close, I wanted to uh, mention something that really stuck with me. I mentioned it at yesterday's hearing. We had 12 pages of individuals that had signed up. Obviously, not everybody had uh, wanted to testify, otherwise we would still be there. But we had 12 pages of individuals who wanted to testify. And the third person who testified was a young woman named Olaji, who mentioned in her remarks, she was affiliated with Clean Water Action, and she mentioned in her remarks that she had family in St. Martin, uh, the island in the Caribbean where 95% of it has been destroyed by recent weather events. Following Bolaji was Kalish, who's with the Sierra Club. He mentioned that he had family in Puerto Rico that he couldn't talk to for a week. He was worried. Luckily, they are fine. But obviously, we're seeing the same effects happening in Puerto Rico. The third speaker after that, so speakers four, five, and six of our top, uh, of our first six speakers, was a gentleman named Grady, who uh, works, works with Elders Climate Action. And Grady had mentioned that he was from Houston. Now, these three individuals didn't know one another. Uh, we didn't plan it this way. Again, we had 12 sheets of people. They are all with different environmental organizations, but hadn't coordinated. And sort of in, in offhand comments had mentioned that they had family in St. Martin, Puerto Rico, and Houston, three uh, islands or towns or locations, cities, that have been utterly devastated by what has happened with climate change and the effect on these superstorms that we've seen this past month. Um, if that doesn't underscore that we're not talking about doing this for our kids or our grandkids, this is happening now. And by God, cities have to lead. This is a great way that Boston can lead. We will have an absolute impact uh, almost right away. It's the right thing to do. Let's make it happen. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Chair recognizes Council Wu. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Is, is that right? I think so. Okay, great. All this new technology, <laughs> Perfect. you know. I want to thank 
echo all of the thanks that uh, the chair of the Environment and Sustainability Committee just issued, uh, starting with, uh, with Councilor O'Malley himself for his leadership on a whole range of issues. Um, this one, I'm particularly proud of our partnership and the coalition that has been with us, you know, as Councilor Jackson likes to say, in front and back all around uh, the mothers and everyone else. I want to thank the administration also uh, for the quick, quick work. We had some concerns coming out of yesterday's hearing and immediately overnight uh, Corporation Council, Mayor Walsh, um, Chief Blackman and, and Katie King and others have been um, working to make sure that the order we have in front of us today represents uh, a solid piece of work that will kick us off in the right direction. I, I have to say I was struck by the same thing as Councilor O'Malley at that hearing. You know, there were maybe two, close to 200 people there. We had lines out the door, but the fact that immediately, as soon as public testimony started, we heard the very real, very tangible, very immediate emotional family impacts of climate change right here in Boston from people sitting right before us uh, at our council hearing. Not only are we creating climate change refugees across the country, I mean, this has been happening in the Middle East for a while with droughts leading to water crises, leading to war, but we're feeling it right at the doorsteps of this country. Uh, Puerto Rico going through the largest humanitarian crisis that the United States has, has seen in a very, very long time. Um, and this week, just a couple days ago, uh, many of us were at a round table that Senator Markey had convened on the Puerto Rico relief situation. Uh, and efforts that he and Mayor Walsh and others in the community have been focusing on. That conversation focused not just on Puerto Rico and how dire the situation is and how we can get them supplies and aid and, and funding, but on Boston because the weather, the, um, the environmental refugees have already started arriving in Boston. Puerto Rican families who are seeking clean water, infrastructure, safety are coming to stay with their family here. Uh, we are looking to welcome them with wide open arms, but we are going to continue to see weather and environmental refugees coming to Boston, and that affects our school systems, that affects our um, housing situation, so climate change is very real in many, many ways uh, that the city and, and the city council will be feeling. So, you know, I think we're faced with a decision as a country and, and as a legislative body. Do we kind of sit by and say, this is the new reality of our weather system, stronger storms, bigger damage, higher floods, and do we try to react to it as much as we can every time, marshal the forces and deliver aid once there's a, a huge crisis? Or do we acknowledge the reality head on that we have to do something to change the situation? We have to change the physical and economic reality for future generations uh, that, that has gotten us to this point. We're in an economic system where large corporate interests are locked into fossil fuel infrastructure, where our greenhouse gas emissions are tied to profits, and in many ways, the changes that we need to see need to reorient us to the green economy, to wind and solar jobs that are actually growing 12 times faster than the average job growth across the country. Massachusetts and the Boston region have been tapping into a large share of those jobs because we've been out in front thanks to the legislature leading on solar. We need to do the same for wind. Uh, and on the city council, we, this is how we do our part today. As Matt said, this is the single largest action that the city council could take to immediately and dramatically increase our renewable energy sourcing in Boston. And not just that, it's seamless for residents. The utility company continues to deliver the billing and be at the table and be a partner. Uh, and there are numerous safeguards in this process, not just for the city to put pause if, if the prices end up being different than we expect, but for any individual at any time to be able to opt out and go back to the original um, default utility contract. So I'm really proud of, of everyone that's been with us and working on this. Thank you so much. I know so many of, of uh, us on the council have been working on this as well. Um, looking forward to seeking a vote on this today and, uh, and then the many steps that will follow to make sure that this is implemented in the way that best fits Boston and then we move on to the other green initiatives that will continue to affect change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Wu.
Oh, Councillor Jackson, had you signaled before? Oh, no. no. Okay, then Councillor Linehan first, then we'll do Councillor Jackson next. Councillor Linehan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I rise to uh, commend the author in for his extraordinary work on this particular issue over virtually his entire career. Um, most people don't know, and if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, a, it's available to each and every one of us to do this ourselves at this time. We can join a program that would allow us to, to claim gr green energy as that source for our particular home. So that's available to those who can afford it or are willing to uh, afford that, that sort of um, uh, energy. And I think to try and to place the green energy in a space that, um, that everybody is allowed to do it, the only issue I have is that it's affordable. So it needs to be affordable. As I've stood up on a number of occasions, sometimes as the only person on the body, even for the Preservation Act, um, so even for the Preservation Act, I, um, I feel that the cost to the individual and especially those who can't afford it, is an issue, and it needs to be addressed as, as we move forward. So I will be supporting this because I believe it's heading in the right direction, and again, I want to congratulate the mayor. Thank you, Councillor Linehan. Councillor Jackson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President, and I want to uh, give propers to Councillor O'Malley uh, as well as you, uh, Madam President, uh, for your leadership. Um, on this. And, and again, I, I do need to set the record straight. Um, it is critical that we know our council led on this. And although not everyone was here, I do want to note that the administration yesterday told us they did not want to move forward on this. Let's understand and let's set the record straight. And I'm glad that, um, I don't know if it's extra coffee at the end of the day, or there was some epiphany that occurred, but this is the right thing to do. And I want to give props and credit where credit's due to Councilor O'Malley and Councilor Wu for standing up for the people of the city of Boston and for standing up for those who don't even live here yet and who actually don't live for the future of the city of Boston. Because we are a coastal city. There have been 13 named storms. We're halfway through the alphabet. We're on Maria. 13 named storms that continue to get stronger and stronger. If you haven't been to the beach, we are a coastal city. And we need to note that if we don't move with urgency, it's not if, it is when will this hit the city of Boston. And by the way, as I noted yesterday, and I need to note today, when we think about whether or not the city of Boston can do this, let's look at some very large towns in the state of Massachusetts that have done this work. Aquina, there are 311 residents in Aquina. Chilmark has 866 residents. Wendell. Tyringham has 327 residents. We have 650 people in the city of Boston. We have 17,000 able city employees that could actually put this uh, in, in motion. Um, and we host a climate conference, uh, yet we have actually not uh, moved forward uh, on this. And we've actually been able to pull together uh, so many things for, th for uh, initiatives that people and the administration and others want to do. This is the right thing to do. Um, this is absolutely uh, the right time to do it. And I think we also need to note, when we look at the cost, uh, cost is a really interesting term. Because when we look at what the cost of doing nothing I have a friend who came in last night at 12 o'clock from Puerto Rico. He has his Juris Doctorate from uh, Tulane University. Uh, his parents are physicians. They left the island with nothing. Um, we have uh, Dominica that has been hit. 
We have several other parts of our country uh, that have been hit. Uh, all of that is a cost, and in addition, there is a human cost uh, to what we're talking about. Um, this is an opportunity for us to lead um, and not end up uh, where, where we would be the 128th out of 351 uh, communities in the city of Austin uh, that would push forward uh, with this. It is absolutely the right thing to do uh, for the now, but most importantly, it's the right thing to do for the future of our city. Um, and again, I applaud your leadership. And I look forward uh, to emphatically supporting this today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Councilor McCarthy, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. <clears throat> it's nice to be in a new chamber. Um, I just and wanted to thank. Uh, it's, it, it's very nice over here. Uh, I wanted to thank Councilor O'Malley and uh, Councilor Wu uh, on their leadership in this in this uh, forum. Um, Matt, I agree with uh, what Councilor Linehan said. You are our green guy, and uh, you've been uh, your leadership is uh, is welcomed on this floor. Um, as I said from the very beginning, um, my concern always was safeguards. Matt walked me through this process several times. I have friends up in the gallery and, and uh, Ricky and Jim who stopped by my office and uh, made sure that I was set straight uh, a while ago. But I think all of us uh, took our time with this for, for a good reason because we've had constituents come to my office who were hedge pinned into signing a document and uh, the energy rates go up and they couldn't get out without paying a fine and all those things and that, that concerned me. Um, and, and through your hard work and Council uh, Wu's hard work, those safeguards uh, are in place. And I think the city of Boston is moving in the right direction. I look forward to voting affirmative. Thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And uh, again, thank you, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Wu, um, for your leadership. I just wanted to pause for a moment because although um, a, very, a confluence of circumstances culturally, um, politically, uh, from a policy standpoint, have led us to this um, this place, this crossroads in our country where we're dealing with, uh, it seems it's incoming every day. Um, I just wanted to pause and just say that I'm very encouraged by the fact that our organizing silos are really breaking down. And that whether we're talking about climate and weather refugees or displacement refugees, that we are getting to a point, finally, um, where we recognize that we are truly in this together and that this is not about the utilities versus the people or landlords versus the people or government versus the people or this neighborhood against this neighborhood and this race against it, that we are realizing that we are truly all in this together. And the only reason uh, we have arrived at this moment uh, and can make the, the steps in this direction that we are um, is because we are finally realizing that. So I just wanted to pause and just say, um, let's continue to be inclusive and intentional and cooperative and collaborative because that has been the reoccurring theme in recent days whenever we've been able to say that we're advancing something uh, legislatively or otherwise, that it is about working cooperatively together. And so I just want to uh, thank uh, the administration, again, commend the makers and thank all the advocates. And again, let's just continue to be inclusive and intentional and cooperative in all of these movements. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Presley. Councillor Malley, had you wanted to speak again? I, oh yeah, sorry, the lights, the new system. <laughs> Councillor Malley, you have thank the floor. Thank you, and th thank you again. I will be brief, uh, quit while I'm ahead, but um, thank you. I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, Kate Sullivan from Central Staff who worked very quickly and efficiently to get our committee report out uh, and make sure that we were able to work with the administration on those changes. And I would just like to say, you know, um, there was talk from the administration yesterday about having a working session. I think Chief Blackman and his team has always said they've been open to this. They, there have been dialogue. So there was never there was never a no from the administration. There was uh, the council president and I, and, and speaking with the mayor, see a real utility in getting this done now, which is why we were able to forego the working session because we addressed some of those concerns ahead of time. So we're grateful for partnership and collaboration all around. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Malley. At this time, Council O'Malley moves for acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1063. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll on docket 1063. And again, in a new draft. Oh, and a new draft, of course. Docket number 1063. Councilor Baker. Yes. Councilor Baker, yes. Councilor Campbell. Yes. Councilor Campbell, yes. Councilor Siomo. Council Siomo, yes. Council Rasabi George. Yes. Council Rasabi George, yes. Council Flaherty. Yes.
Council Flaherty, yes. Council Jackson. Council Jackson, yes. Council Lamatina. Council Lamatina, yes. Council Linehan. Yes. Council Linehan, yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council McCarthy, yes. Councilor O'Malley. Yes. Councilor O'Malley, yes. Council Presley. Yes. Council Presley, yes. Council Wu. Yes. Council Wu, yes. And Council Zakem. Yes. Council Zakem, yes. Madam President, docket number 1063 has received a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Docket, come on, please. Docket 1063 has been passed with a unanimous vote. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Docket number 1304, Council Zakem offered the following resolution in support of Mass House Bill 2091 and Senate Bill 373, an act automatically registering eligible voters. Councilor Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. This uh, resolution is pretty well summarized uh, in the title here. There are bills at the State House and uh, both houses, the representatives in the, in the Senate, that would allow for automatic voter registration for eligible voters in the Commonwealth. Um, you know, as we all just observed last week, uh, an incredibly low turnout a municipal election, our state elections, uh, a little higher turnout, but still there are many barriers um, to access. We actually just had a hearing in the Special Committee on Civil Rights last week on other ways that we can increase voter turnout, lower barriers to voting, and as we've seen in other states that currently allow automatic re voter registration, several in New England, along with as places as diverse as Georgia, Alaska, California, West Virginia, not places that are often, uh, not states that are often on the same page when it comes to issues like this. Um, it's just, it, it's, what we're talking about the right to vote, I think, is the fundamental right that protects all of our other rights in our society. And whatever we can do to lower those barriers is important. Um, certainly, I think, in the city of Boston, uh, one of the challenges we have for folks registering to vote is that if here's a primary in September, or preliminary election in municipal, many people, especially in uh, my district and Council Siomo's district, have just moved on September 1st. And by definition, you are, you know, unless you're planning to go vote, or register to vote, on the day you've just moved in, gotten through your U-Haul, done everything else, you're many times missing a deadline. And that's something else we're looking at is the 20-day uh, deadline. But I just think it's important that we do this. I am, um, you know, we're gonna ask that we uh, suspend an resolution to, uh, join our friends at the State House in putting this in place. So it does not change the requirements of voter registration, obviously, but it does make it easier. I think similarly we've seen such success with the motor voter law when people go to the RMV and they're offered the opportunity to vote. It's the same documentation that's required. It just means that uh, once you provide that to the state, you will be registered to vote and able to participate in our elections. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Councilor O'Malley, you have the floor. I just rise to uh, commend the maker, Councilor Zakem, for his leadership on this. Uh, ask that my name be added. Uh, I can remember vividly as, as a you know, uh, relatively nerdy college student following election returns in 1998, which was the first year that the state of Win uh, Minnesota had, um, uh, it wasn't automatic voter, but it was same day voter registration, and turnout was 71% for governor's race. Compare that with 14% a week ago for our preliminary election. We need to make it easier, not harder for people to vote. This is a fantastic first step, um, and it's going to just benefit so much down the line. So thank you for your leadership and look forward to voting in support. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councilor O'Malley's name? Please add Councilor Campbell, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Jackson, Councilor Presley, and Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Oh, no. Oh, thank you. Just to sign on. Please add the chair's name. Please add Councillor Lamatina. And please add Councillor McCarthy. At this time, Councillor Zaka moves for suspension and adoption of docket 1304. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and docket 1304 has been adopted. Docket number 1305. Council Zakem offered the following resolution in support of dining hall workers at Northeastern University. Council Zakem, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm impressed that my microphone is not timed out uh, in this new system today. I know I've been had a lot on the agenda, and I appreciate my uh, colleagues' indulgence. Um, this is uh, an important resolution. Uh, just as we speak, um, men and women of uh, Local 26 are organizing a vote 
with their membership who are dining hall workers at Northeastern University, much of which is in my district, some of which uh, is in Council Jackson's district. And, um, you know, what I think is important right now is that as we have in the past, uh, most recently with the Harvard dining hall workers, also represented by Local 26, uh, stood up and called on our large institutions to treat their workers fairly, people who are integral uh, to the operations, to their students' lives and, and health um, by feeding them, providing meals and nutrition. And what we're trying to see here is the average worker right now on the Northeastern campus is making a little less than $22,000 a year. And what they're trying to do is make these jobs sustainable uh, through these negotiations. Negotiations are ongoing. Um, I think there have been some steps in the right direction, but right now the negotiations are with Northeastern subcontractor. And what we really need to see is we need to get these to be livable wage jobs. These are folks who are supporting families, who are working in our communities, and who are working at some of the wealthiest institutions uh, in the country, in the world. And I, we just ask that both Northeastern and their subcontractor um, have a fair and open discussion with their workers, and that they have a negotiation, as we often do uh, here in the city of Boston with the uh, unions that represent the city of Boston employees. Uh, it's important if we're going to talk about striking a blow. We just talked about displacement. We just talked about housing. We just talked about high rents in the city of Boston. We need to make sure that when people are working and working hard and working full-time jobs, that they're going to have a livable wage. And while we can't solve that problem every day, I do think it's important that we stand who are standing up for themselves, who are organizing themselves, and who are working to make our community a better place. So again, um, while this vote is ongoing today, I'm going to also ask that we uh, suspend and adopt this. Um, I certainly encourage um, everyone to, uh, to be supportive of this. I think it's important. Local 26 uh, continues to be a voice for our uh, hospitality workers and restaurant workers it's, and cafeteria workers in the city of Boston. And it's been a pleasure to work with them, and I certainly I think it's very important that this body, once again, as we have over and over again, stands with workers, stands with those who need our protection and our support, and calls on their employer to, uh, to act fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zakem. Um, and Councillor Zakem, is it accurate? I believe the clerk had flagged for me. We're oh, substituting yes. new language. So yes, sorry, there were a typo on the first version. I apologize, but there is no substantive change between um, the substituted draft and the one that uh, you were, had in your folder. Okay, hearing no objection, the, the new revised language um, is before the council. I saw a motion to sign on. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councilor Linehan's name? Please add Councilor Lamatina, Councilor McCarthy, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Campbell, Councilor Baker, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Presley, you have the floor. Uh, I just rise to commend the maker and also Local 26, but I also just wanted to say following um, the, the, um, the strike online that I've been very encouraged by the number of students that are um, standing in solidarity uh, with workers. You know, these are students that are sharpening their tools and developing their minds to emerge into the world in this city to do, to do good and to take on uh, many social injustices. And I'm glad that while they are students, they are not turning a blind eye to or being complicit in their silence about the ways in which disparities and injustices are being perpetuated on their very campus. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge um, the activism of our students. And again, I commend the maker. I thank Local 26. Uh, for what they do um, every day. Proud to be a steadfast ally with them. And I ask to have my name added. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Presley. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councilor Presley's name? Uh, please add the chair's name. I can't believe, I can't remember if I signaled that. And um, Councilor Jackson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I have uh, Northeastern, a significant portion of Northeastern um, in my district. Um, and I've, I've had trouble uh, with Northeastern and Councilor uh, uh, Councilor Zakem and I, we asked Northeastern to come and discuss something with us uh, when they added assault rifles. And they told us absolutely categorically no. And they still have not come uh, to this day. Um, and I think it is notable uh, that we have folks in our community who are working hard every day to make a mere $22,000 who work for Local 26. When the president of Northeastern, President Ayun, makes $3.1 million, Madam President. $3.1 million. Um, and we also have a university um, that has tossed in our face that they don't want to pay pilot. And in fact, when they send a check to Boston, they refuse to even call it a pilot payment. 
And Boston University, which has about the same uh, uh, physical Im uh, imprint in the city of Boston, sends us over $8 million a year. And Northeastern sends us $900,000 and says it's not a pilot payment. Um, Northeastern, pay, pay a fair wage to your workers. You want to build buildings all over our district. Uh, you've just built a science center, a nearly $200 million building, and currently you are building, over the objection of my office and the community, a 22, I'm sorry, I apologize, 21-story, 812-room, 812-bed uh, skyscraper on Columbus Avenue where buildings are eight stories. Yet, you can't pay your workers, people who work hard uh, every single day. $62,000, uh, actually, I'm sorry, $63,000 a year to attend, yet you can't pay your workers. Um, Councillor Zakem, I appreciate uh, you holding your thumb down on uh, Northeastern University. We should emphatically make sure that all colleges and universities are paying at least a livable wage. Um, and yes, we call them nonprofits, but uh, when I see uh, the head of a university making $3.1 million, that doesn't scream nonprofit to me. Do right by the workers, do right by Local 26, uh, and I look forward uh, to voting in affirmative, and I also ask that you add my name. Thank you, Council President Wolf. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Madam Clerk, could you please add Councilor Jackson's name to docket 1305? At this time, Councilor Zaka moves for adoption of docket 130, uh, suspension and adoption of docket 1305 in a new draft. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, and docket 1305 has been adopted in a new draft. Docket number 1306, Councilors Baker and Zakem offer the following ordinance by adding new section and subsections of CBC Ordinance Chapter 9, Eviction Data Collection. Councilor Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Again, I, I rise here. I, I, I want to thank the work of Councilor Zakem and, and also Council Flaherty. The three of us were kind of bouncing around a lot of um, ideas, and we wanted to make sure that along with the Home Rule petition, we had a parallel path that we could vote on in here and, and potentially take um, more swift action uh, with data collection and notification. And again, I think that if we're able to see the trends in, in, in a very important pieces, if someone is notified and with that notification, we're able to let them know of their rights in the, the Office of Housing Stabilization. Now that person is, is in front of an advocate that's gonna, gonna, going to help them in their situations. I think that can potentially do more than what the Home Rule Petition, my opinion, can do. Um, and, and again, Great work. I had the two lawyers with me when we were talking about all this stuff, thank goodness. But um, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baker. Councillor Zakem, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councillor Baker and uh, Councillor Flaherty and uh, Chief Dillon uh, and Corporation Council, the Mayor's Office, uh, for their work on this. This is certainly intended to be a, a complementary legislation to the Home Rule that we just passed to do what we can without a change in state law to make sure we're finding out where these evictions are happening, where people are being displaced, and that way we can get the resources in there. Um, you know, I think as we all know, uh, we are limited uh, under state law by what the city can do on its own, but this is something that we can do, that this body can pass and that can be enacted swiftly to find out where these things are happening, to make sure we get services like the Office of Housing Stability, like Greater Boston Legal Services, like so many of the other great nonprofit organizations in touch with tenants in real time so they're aware of their rights and that they can make sure that they're being treated fairly. Um, so I look forward to working on this and hopefully passing it swiftly. I think this is something that while not a, not a cure-all, uh, is an important step in the right direction in fixing this issue of displacement in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Yeah. Madam President, please add my name. I'd like to congratulate and commend uh, Councilor Baker and Zakem for partnering on this ordinance and for really gra to getting a grasp as to what the real issue is, which is the, the data collection, to have actual real-time information with respect to where the evictions are happening and, more importantly, who's doing it. So. Um, and, and the process that will take place that will then allow us to 
take advantage of the very precious resources that we do have as a city uh, through a variety of different departments um, and funding streams, and particularly, uh, and our hope is that CPA will provide some relief as well, but that we'll be able to direct it to where it needs to go. So I've um, uh, been around a little bit uh, as the longest serving counselor. Uh, Jim Brooks Stabilization Act, Just Cause Eviction, uh, has uh, reared its head in a multitude of different forms during my tenure. Uh, the clerk can probably attest to it as well during her tenure. So my sense is it arguably probably will, uh, will, will die up at Beacon Hill, uh, but this will be the real work. This will be the game changer. I know Councillor um, Linehan alluded to it in his comments with respect to Dark at 0106, but this uh, will really make a difference. If we're able to uh, put uh, our uh, collective minds around uh, this ordinance and particularly getting that data and being able to address where it's happening, who's doing it, I think we'll, uh, it'll have a lasting impact on, on, uh, on the folks that are that need it the most, the people that are being displaced, our seniors, folks on fixed incomes, but particularly uh, as uh, more developers coming and Boston becomes even more attractive than it already is and more people want to come here and all the kids from around the world that come into Boston and get those diplomas. In years past, they would come across the stage, get their diploma, and then they'd head back home. Um, that brain power, those kids are staying. Uh, they're staying because the economy's great. They're staying because it's a happening place. Uh, they're falling in love with the Red Sox, they're falling in love with the Patriots, the Bruins, the Celtics, they're falling in love with the waterfront um, and restaurants and, and, and establishments. And so um, all of that, Boston just a great attractive place that it is, and as a result of that, we need this ordinance now more than ever to really make a difference in, to what's going out in all of our neighborhoods. So I enthusiastically sign on and look forward to expedited hearings on the subject matter. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Madam Clerk, please add Councilor Flaherty's name. Please add Councilor Linehan, Councilor LaMatina, Councilor Jackson. Councilor McCarthy, Councilor O'Malley, Councilor Presley, Councilor Sabi George, Councilor Siomo, Councilor Campbell. Please have the chair's name. Docket number 1306 will be assigned to the Committee on Government Operations. Personnel orders. Docket number 1307, Councilor Wu for Councilor Campbell. Councilor Campbell moves for suspension and passage of docket 1307. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1307 has been passed. And I am informed by the clerk that there is one late filed matter, um, which is mine, I apologize, uh, which will be added in uh, absence of objection. Hearing none, the matter is added. Madam Clerk, could you please read um, just a, a clause or two of the late file? Thank you very much, Madam Offered by Council Michelle Wu in the City Council. Order for hearing to review plans for public facilities in the seaport. Whereas the South Boston Waterfront or Seaport neighborhood has undergone an unprecedented residential transformation with the population more than doubling between 2000 and 2015. Therefore, be it ordered that the appropriate committee of the Boston City Council hold a hearing to review the unprecedented residential for transformation of the South Boston waterfront and to discuss plans to exp expand access to public facilities and services in the neighborhoods. Representatives from various City of Boston departments and other interested parties will be invited, filed on October 3rd, 2017. Chair recognizes Councilor Wu. This is a larger issue that I'm hoping to explore in terms of development and community process and input across the city anyway. This particular facet of it uh, I think is an extreme example where we are seeing Fort Point and the Seaport experience an incredible uh, boom in development overall, but especially in the number of people who will be living in the neighborhood. Right now an estimated probably 4,000 people in the area now. Um, the projections, some from the, B the BPDA, are that it will be upwards of 26,000 within the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, all of the permitted big buildings leading to a lot of people uh, and not much infrastructure that it sits on. So this particular hearing was actually requested by uh, colleagues at the state level and in the community given how quickly everything is developing there. And uh, we want to make sure that as we're talking about a uh, five or even six-fold increase in the number of residents in a neighborhood 
that currently has no fire station, no library, no school, no civic space. And even as the council was discussing the re-precincting effort and splitting uh, Ward 6, Precinct 1, so that that area would have quicker access to a polling location, the only, potent, the only feasible place that we could have put a polling location was District Hall, which is in a public-private lease set to expire, uh, you know, part of ongoing conversations. But there really is no, there's no community center, nothing. Um, and there's a whole separate conversation about transportation infrastructure, but wanted to get this on the docket um, and in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Loon. Chair, Chair recognizes Council McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. Um, thank you, Council Wu, for writing this. This is really uh, perfect timing. As Vice Chair of the Public Safety Committee, uh, we've heard several times that uh, we also we have the issue with state troopers and uh, Boston Police Department. Uh, and we heard quite clearly from uh, Commissioner Fenn that he's very concerned uh, that the fact that the, the biggest, the best tower unit to get to that area of the city uh, is over on the Greenway. And as we know, if anybody travels the Greenway, the best way to travel the Greenway is by foot uh, or by bike. And it's certainly not by, uh, by car or vehicle and, or fire truck. Uh, so this comes at a perfect timing. So I, I look forward to, uh, I sign on and uh, I look forward for a hearing. Thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Would you just like to sign on? Will you please sign on, Council Flaherty, and also Madam Clerk, sign Council Campbell, Council Siomo, Council Asabi George, um, Councilor, Council Ayanna Presley, Council Matt O'Malley, Council Zakum, and Councilor, Council Linehan, would you like to speak? Chair recognizes Council Linehan. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, I just rise to uh, uh, commend the author and for initiating um, yeah. this particular matter. Uh, I, I feel comfortable that in my absence, when I no longer sit here on the Boston Co City Council, that there'll be ample people to look out for that part of the city, and thank you. Thank you, Council Linehan. Um, Madam Clerk, will you please also sign my name? And will you place Place the late file in planning and devel development, please. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Uh, we are through with late files. There are no late filed matters for the consent agenda, uh, but the consent agenda does need to be adopted, so chair moves for adoption. All in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Consent agenda is adopted. Uh, would anyone like to pull a matter from the green sheets? Green sheets. Councilor Lamantina, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. On page 7 or 9, docket number 1054. 1054. Madam Clerk, could you please read docket 1054 into the record? Page, Set, page 7 of page 9. Page 7. One, I'm sorry, Councillor, I'm sorry, I missed. 1054, right in 1054. Thank you very much, no sorry about that. Um, in the Committee on Parks, Recreation, and Transportation, docket number 1054, sponsored by the Mayor, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept an, and expand a grant of $447,863 for the Jobs, Access, and Reverse Commute Program awarded by the United States Department of Transportation, passed through the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to be administered by the Boston Transportation. The grant will fund the City of Boston Neighborhood mm -hmm. Mobility Micro Hubs Project. Docket 1054, now before the Council. Uh, Councilor Lamatina, please proceed. Thank you. Um, Madam President, this grant of $447,000 will fund the installation of interactive kiosks in Roxbury and East Boston uh, that will show real-time transit information to the commuters. They will be centered around subway station, bus network mo uh, models, and local destinations such as community centers and small business districts. They will also provide access to bike share, car share, secure bike parking, riot healing, pickup spots, wayfinding, and free Wi-Fi. By themselves, as a network, they have potentially will improve transportation connections for all. 
Uh, the transportation department will lead the interagency team, including uh, the new urban mechanics, the Boston Bikes, uh, BPDA, Public Works, MBTA, and the Environmental Department to design and implement these uh, micro hubs. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Lamatina. This time, Councilor Lamatina moves for passage of docket 1054. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it, docket 1054 has been passed. Any other items from the green sheets? Seeing none. Uh, any statements or announcements to the group? Councilor McCarthy, you have the floor. I'll be uh, <clears throat> brief. I just want to do while well, let everybody know uh, regarding uh, the airplane issues that we've been having. Uh, Councilor Baker and I, along with uh, Katie King, uh, Intergovernmental Relations Director representing Mayor Walsh, uh, met with uh, Congressman Capuano. Uh, as well as uh, Congressman Lynch in Washington, D.C., uh, to get updates on uh, everything that's been going on. Um, there was a, uh, I will send everybody via email, um, there's a 90-page uh, report that came out from an MIT professor that uh, uh, Congressman Lynch and Congressman Capuano uh, got to do a study. It is not a uh, great reading, I will be honest with you. So uh, be, get lots of coffee and get ready. Uh, it's 90 pages of uh, data. Um, they're working very, very hard, and I am pleased to say that we're all on the same page, and we're taking a bigger than city, but a metro Boston uh, view of this. And again, this comes down to flying over the exact same pattern all day long, morning, noon, and night. I know Cass has been woken up in the morning uh, because of the, the earlier flights. We all recognize that Logan Airport is the economic engine that drives Boston. We know that people come in here from all over the world. We're not getting rid of Logan Airport. So the people who say move it out to Sturbridge, that you know, it's just silly talk. Logan's going to stay, but we have to make sure that the pain and suffering, the health issues, the waking babies up is spread out throughout the, all the communities, not just the poorest in Boston. And uh, that's what uh, the congressmen are working on. Um, that's what uh, our report, um, I, and obviously if uh, Frank wants to say something about it um, as well, but I feel very, very confident that uh, our congressmen are working diligently uh, to move this process forward. Working with the FAA is not easy. Um, there's several uh, hearings that Congressman Lynch uh, gets the Southie up, if you will, and tells the FAA exactly how he feels about them. Um, but we're working hard to make sure that it moves forward. So uh, I urge you to read the report that I will send you, or at least glance through it, uh, and you'll get an idea of the heat maps at exactly uh, what we're talking about here. Uh, and it is an issue. Um, we plan on having some type of uh, town hall uh, later on in the year or the beginning of next year, once when everybody gets to digest MIT's uh, report. So that's it from Washington. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor McCarthy. Councilor Baker, do you want to add anything? Okay. And Councillor Lamatina, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. First, I want to say this looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, I want to thank the administration and uh, Pat Brophy and the mayor for, uh, geez, I've been coming here since 1974, believe it or not. So I'm dating myself, but not as old as you. Um, I just want to, uh, <laughs> I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, my colleagues who came out on Monday for the Italian flag raising ceremony. Um, Council President, Councilor George, and Councilor Flaherty. Actually, it was Councilor Flaherty who came to me and said, Sal, we should do a flag raising for the Italians. And uh, so thank you. But I just want to take this opportunity and wish you all a happy Columbus Day. And um, hope to see you at my last parade on Sunday. It's in the North End. Um, you know, Columbus Day has been a tradition um, since I believe it's 80 years this year. Um, so um, happy Columbus Day to all my friends here. And to you, Maxio. Happy Columbus Day. My father. Thank you, Councilor Lamatina. And Councilor Baker. Um, a, a couple things. I, I wanted to echo what Councilor Lamatina uh, said about the chamber. Good work on your part, Michelle. You were you drove quite a bit of it. But I wanted to talk, and, and I'm sure we will close a memorial in Las about Las Vegas. Um, having kids that are getting ready to go into that time where they'll go out and they'll be going to, to concerts and that sort of stuff and with all the evil that we have in the world that I just wanted to, uh, this really affected me and, and I don't really know why because there's so much going on. Um, you know, I just wanted to to let people know that there is still good in the world and, and, and we as leaders in our city can always 
you know, speak with kindness in our heart and speak with love in our heart and, you know, try and get through this stuff right here. It's, it's, th there was a shooting in Tennessee, I think the day after five or six people were killed, didn't even make, didn't even make the newspaper. It, it, what is going on with our, with our country? Um, so I just kind of wanted to mention that, say that uh, I, I was really affected and it's, and it's, I think it's about my children. I'm not really sure what it is. So thank you for indulging me. <clears throat> thank you, Councilor Baker. At this time, I'd like to ask all counselors and guests to please rise. Today, the Boston City Council will adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councilor Flaherty, Francis A. Lyons. For Councilor La Matina, Elevira C. Nazaro. For Councilor Linehan, Bruce Lahane. For Council McCarthy, Charles F. Fernstein and Mary E. Hines. For Councilors La Matina and O'Malley, Tom Petty. And on, be on behalf of the entire council, all the victims, survivors, and families impacted in Las Vegas, a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Chair moves that when the council adjourns today, we do so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. We're scheduled to meet again Wednesday, October 18th at 12 noon in the Ionella Chamber. All in favor of adjournment say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Council is adjourned.